Hello and welcome to SJS classes. So I will be continuing my discussions on the poem The Temple Bell by B. Sukhata Kumari. I hope you have watched the part 1 of this discussion. If you haven't yet watched it, please go to my YouTube channel and watch the first part of my discussions on this particular poem. So in the earlier video I gave you an introduction to the poet and also the poem and I also discussed the first uh, few stanzas of the poem. It's from the first few stanzas that we understand that the poet has come to this temple which is bat infested and is now in shambles. You see a banyan tree which is almost crouching. You have a pawn which is most covered. The lamps that are there in the temple are almost broken. And there is nothing but a deep solitude that permeates the place. It's in such a context, it's in such a circumstance that the poet comes to hear the twinkling sound of a tender bell. And this sound makes the poet think, now for whom does the bell toll? Who lives here in this lonely place, in this lonely space and for whom does the bell toll? And she comes over to the fact that it's no one who has rung the bell. It's just the wind that has caused the bell to ring. And she tries to equate this bell with a Muniganya who has long been out of touch with the human world. We also see that she is uh, trying to question uh, the motive behind the ringing of the bell. And she again asks this question, who is here to listen to, this, to the sound of the bell? You have a god who has turned to a mere rock. Or does the bell, bell ring for the rocks who come secretly to sell faith? Or for the bats that have infested the space? The poet also delves deep into the past of the bell. She states that the bell was once cast in bronze in smelting heat and it was hung up above the holy corridor by someone who had joined his palms together in prayer and this temple did have prosperous years. There were times when people used to throng into the, into the temple to pay homage to their favorite goats and the temple premises were redolent with fragrant flowers and the lamps in the temple were shining bright. So there was definitely a good time which the temple enjoyed. But as of now, the temple, the temple premise is nothing but a place that offers deep solitude that, to the person who visits the space. Let's discuss the remaining stanzas in the poem. The temple bell, its edges cracked, it still sings to the wind's touch. But who is there to listen now? How to hear this tinkle amidst the market's din and the leader's row in the public square? Who cares for this frail fable music amidst lusty lurid songs sizzling away in movie theatres? So at the very outset the poet had established the fact that the temple is in shambles, it's in a dilapidated condition and so is the bell. It has rugged edges, its edges are cracked and even though its edges are cracked, it does not stop from spreading music. But the question remains, who is there to listen now? And if at all there are people, the poet asks, how are they supposed to Listen it when there is so much of loud, harsh and strident noise around. The noise from the market, the noise of the leaders roaring in the public square, the lusty lurid songs that come from movie theatres. Now, in the midst of all these noises, how are they supposed to listen to this frail and feeble music coming from the temple? The lights are out, exit all, exit the priest too, famished leaving the gold alone in the dark. So everyone has left the temple, even the priest has gone. But the question remains, that question is asked, asked at the outset of the next stanza. The question that remains is, yet why this chime from the bell? So everyone has 
left and even the priest has gone from the temple. But the question that still haunts the poet is, for whom does the bell toll? Why this chime from the bell? The poet tries to imagine what the entire song is about, the song from the bell is about. Jarring notes in the lonely dark, perhaps it is doing its dharma, singing out songs, now faded, that once it sang to glory. It sings of the spade that reached out in the dark mind where it lay asleep, of the god of fire who sanctified it in the heat of meditation, of the ancient dawn that gifted its melody, of the hand that hung it up here in prayer and then wiped the streaming tears of the luster of the primal sound echoing inside every day. So the poet imagines that even though nobody is there in that space, the bell still tolls so as to do its dharma, the duty that it has been, uh, the duty that has been confer conferred on this uh, entity. So, and the, the poet also tries to imagine what the song is about and she comes to this conclusion that the song might be about the spade that reached out in the dark mine and took it out, took the bronze block outside so that it could be converted, it could be molded into a bell. The song also might be about the god of fire who sanctified it, who made it holy in the heat of meditation. It might be also about that ancient dawn that gifted its melody. It could be either interpreted as uh, the bell was uh, molded during the or the bell was made during the dawn time or it could be also be interpreted as the soft breeze that makes the bell toll during the dawn time. So the song could be about the dawn time that actually gifted its melody. It could also be about the hand that hung it up here in prayer, the person who hung it up there with a lot of prayer in his mind and heart. And it could also be about the luster of the primal sound. The primal sound, a sound that outdoes all other sounds which echoes inside every day, echoes inside from the temple, echoes inside the, uh, t the bell every day. It could, it may refer to the the Om sound, the Om Kara, that is actually the sound of creation, uh, as per certain Indian religions. So in the previous stanza we had, oh, in this stanza we have a poet thinking about what the song might be about. Roused is the life spirit even now to the bell's lonely tinkle the sound of the conch in the temple, the procession carrying the golden idol, seven gold-decked elephants swaying in a row, the congregation of men around the yard, rows of lamps shone in their hearts as figures of beauteous women ranged on the pillars and a hundred hands lifted to ring the bell, all in a chorus calling out to God. But there are no takers, not a soul, to listen. So in, from this particular stanza, we get to understand what it was like in the ancient earlier days when someone used to visit the temple. Now, roused is the life spirit even now. Even now when you listen to the music coming from the bell, your life spirit is evoked. The Atman or the soul, if you can connect with the Omkara word, the primal sound that you came across in the previous stanza. So your Atman, your soul is evoked even now when you listen to the sound of the bell. The sound of the conch in the temple, the procession carrying the golden idol. So the sound of the bell arouses these visuals in the mind and soul of the poet. It evokes the sound of the conch. It brings the sight of the procession carrying the golden idol of the god or goddess the seven gold at elephants swaying in a row, the congregation of men around the yard, rows of lamps shone in their hearts. So the poet gets back to all these visuals probably once she enjoyed or probably once everyone enjoyed during their visit to this temple. So also the figures of beauteous women ranged on the pillars, arranged on the pillars and a hundred hands lifted to ring the bell all in a chorus calling out to God. 
so these things happened these were the sites that you would have confronted during the prosperous years of the temple but we have a problem as of now there are no takers not a soul to listen so the sound of the bell evokes all these imageries all these sounds in the poet but as of now it's only the poet that is there to enjoy all these sights and sounds in this long night you who dare to stay alone here in this temple yard melody incarnate you who would awaken to the touch of the wind though of faded sound and maimed at the rim let me for once greet you and stand before you in prayer so we come down to the last stanza of the poem the poet says in this long night you who dare to stand alone so she addresses the bell and says you who dare to stand alone because all who were there in the bell has gone out there is no one in the bell and it's nothing but a lonely solitary place so you who dare to stay alone here in this temple yard melody incarnate earlier we saw that the poet tried to equate the bell with a muniganya and as of now she says that the bell is actually the incarnation of melody the human form of melody the poet sees the bell as an incarnation the human form or physical form of melody you who would awaken to the touch of the wind so you are even influenced by the wind you are ready to spread this heavenly holy music when the wind touches you even when the wind touches you to the touch of the wind though of faded sound and maimed at the rim so even though you your sound is faded even though the music that uh, you are giving us is something which is very much faded even though you are cracked even though you are in a dilapidated condition even though you are wounded so even though you are wounded even though you are in a dilapidated condition you give you spread out this music and for that let me for once greet you and stand before you in prayer so let me greet you let me stand before you in pray, prayer because you are do, doing your dharma you are doing the duty that has been conferred upon you so we come to a point where the poet has so much respect uh, for this bell that she tries to convey or pay homage to this entity after reading the poem this might be perhaps the conclusion that we can arrive at The poem is probably an appeal made by the poet to restore religious faith in our day-to-day -day life. The materialistic aspects that we enjoy in life are gradually taking us away from divinity and spirituality. The poet's sensitive heart laments all the degradation of ethics in our contemporary society and appeals for a reinstatement of spiritual and ethical values in our lives. the poem thus could be said that is an eye opener towards the dilapidated state of the temple our spirituality and culture in general so this poem was translated into english by pp revendran so that is all about the temple bell i hope now you have an uh, now you have a proper understanding regarding the poem as well as the poet thank you so much for being with me i'll see you in the next video lesson thank you Oh, 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 oh